Aaron, do I have a quorum? Okay, fantastic. Yeah, that's fine. Maybe not a copy. Just that. All right, Aaron, um, let's go ahead and get started. This is a joint climate change and sustainability uh, committee meeting along with a governmental affair uh, committee meeting. It is a joint uh, committee meeting. So with that, uh, Aaron, we'll start with roll call. Chair Moreno present, Council Member Green present, Council Member Harris present, Council Member Jeruso present. We have a quorum of both committees. All right, thank you, Aaron. And Aaron, please go through the agenda for us so that uh, people at home can, can listen in to what we'll be considering today. Of course. The first voting item on the resolution is a resolution related to the community solar program. Madison Energy Investments filed a motion to amend the rules. This resolution attends to that motion. The second voting item is related to the utility assistance program. It is a cooperative endeavor agreement. I'm sorry, a subrecipient agreement for ARPA funds with total community action to allocate $3.2 million in ARPA funds for utility assistance. The remaining items on the, on the agenda are presentations, one on the city vehicle fleet, the second on a Lincoln Beach update, the third on building performance standards, and finally, a presentation from the Jefferson Orleans and Irish Channel neighbors regarding an air quality concern in their neighborhoods. All right, Aaron, thank you so much. And uh, Council Member Thomas has joined us as well, so let that reflect uh, the record as well. Thank you. Uh, let me start with agenda item number two. Andrew, I think you'll be presenting on that one. Is that correct? All right, this is community solar, this particular resolution. Um, what we're trying to do here is expand the community solar project and also make it easier for people to get involved in it. You all may recall um, that in 2019, we finalized the South's only community solar program, a policy designed to deliver the cost savings and environmental benefits of renewable energy to renters and, other, and others who are unable to access rooftop solar. We've made a number of modifications to this program already so that we can continue to modernize it and make it more competitive with other programs elsewhere. But today we are proposing a giant leap forward. With the passage of the Federal Inflation Reduction Act, solar energy is about to be unleashed through tax credits and new investments. So we wanna ensure that our community solar program will be on the cutting edge to accelerate its growth now that the federal financial tools are finally available. This resolution increase, increases the potential size of community solar systems to five megawatts and also asks parties to comment on a host of modernizations that would make our program one of the foremost in the country. The resolution sets a brief timeline and technical conference to gather these comments meant to catalyze a new set of exciting projects that could provide bill savings and climate impact far into the future right here in New Orleans. Andrew, I'll turn it over to you for any additional uh, comments. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, you, you did a great job uh, summarizing this. So what we've done here, as you all recognize, uh, <laughs> is that we've had this program for a few years now, and we're going to um, make some changes, hopefully, uh, that make it a little bit more, um, I think, uh, a little bit more accessible for those who want to access it. So. The uh, major changes we're going to approve, hopefully, uh, on April 6th would be to change the size of the project. So these are solar projects that now can be up to five megawatts large. And then um, uh, there's another change that we're going to deny, but uh, ultimately we're going to ask all the parties, and we've had a number of people, stakeholders, join this process over the past um, seven months that this has been going on, eight months. And because of those uh, stakeholders' comments, we've asked now that we kind of dig in on some issues that would make, again, this more accessible to a lot more folks. Um, some of those issues include, of course, um, uh, comments on the tariff rate, the rate paid, the uh, definition of a low-income customer, um, whether or not there should be consolidated billing, uh, the ownership and valuation of RECs or renewable energy credits, and uh, whether we should increase the minimum requirement of low-income subscribers per uh, project, and of course, whether or not um, there should be um, guaranteed PPAs. So all of these changes um, are, again, uh, based on some comments made by many of the stakeholders. We've had both local and national stakeholders join this conversation. Um, we have brought up these new issues, and the appropriate thing to do here uh, that the council is doing here is allowing 
um, some more comment to refine some of those things to make a record and to solicit information from all those stakeholders so that we can get the right program and, and put it in the right posture to be successful. So we have about 60-ish days that we're going to uh, put this back out there for folks to comment and then to reply to those comments. Um, and at that point, we'll, the council will be able to make some determinations about the, uh, the final rules of this program. I'm happy to answer any questions, if there are any. Any questions? Seeing none, um, let me go to public comment. Um, just so everyone's clear, I'm going to stick um, very harsh to the two-minute rule just because we have a very lengthy agenda today. Uh, first up is Elizabeth Soychok, followed by Jesse George. Elizabeth? I don't see Elizabeth. Jesse, come on up then. Oh, there you are, Elizabeth. Come on. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Soychak, and I live in um, Councilman Jerusa's district. And I just wanted to, I'm here as a representative of, uh, I'm the co-chair of Climate Reality Project New Orleans, and I'm also a member of 350 New Orleans that helped set the uh, part of FNO that helped set the renewable portfolio standard for the city. And um, we support this we support this resolution and um i am also part of together new orleans so i would like to echo what everybody following me has to say this morning and thank you very much for implementing this thank, thank you mr Soychuk. jesse george followed by pierre moses actually i think this might be Thank you, uh, Jesse George, on behalf of the Alliance for Affordable Energy. Just like to say that the Alliance is in support of the increase in eligible project size from two to five megawatts, and that we look forward to participating in uh, the process to help further refine these rules. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse. Appreciate that. Pierre Moses, followed by Mary Ann um, Mushat. Mushat. Pierre. You mind if Mary Ann speaks first? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Good morning. And Good morning. I'm Marianne Moshat with Kevin New Orleans. Put, put the mic closer to you. There we go. So we can hear you. Uh, my, I'm Marianne Moshat uh, with Together New Orleans. And first off, we want to thank you all, members of the council who joined us Saturday for the grand opening of the first two community lighthouse resiliency hubs at Broadmoor Church and Bethlehem Church. Okay. It was March 22nd, 2022, almost exactly one year ago, that we first presented the idea of Community Lighthouse to this council. It was just an idea then. A good idea, but still thoughts in our heads, words on, and pictures on paper. Twelve months later, these ideas have become actual hubs of resiliency. Two projects complete and 22 more in the pipeline for immediate construction. Madam Chair, your leadership and championing of the Community Lighthouse has been particularly important, and we thank you and all, and all the members of the Council for your support and leadership. Community Lighthouse helps strengthen our electrical grid's resiliency, but we are here today to make a commitment to helping address another crisis, the affordability of electricity. We believe Community Solar has extraordinary potential to address this crisis. We were excited when the city council passed rules to bring community solar to our system, but that was four years ago. And, not, and since then, not a single community solar project has been developed. The conclusion is clear. We didn't get the rules right. If the car doesn't start, there's a problem with the car. If the phone doesn't make calls, it's not a working phone. If community solar rules don't result in community in any community solar projects, those rules need to change. We commend you for taking action today to recognize that the community solar rules need changing, and we want to make a commitment to you. If we get those rules right this time, Together New Orleans will help bring one of the first community solar projects to the city. A year ago, we presented an idea, Community Lighthouse, which has become a reality. A year from now, we want to all gather on Dwyer Road off Ch Chef Mentor. Ms. Mishat, that's your time. Okay, to cut a ribbon of community solar project to serve our community. Thank you. All right, Pierre Moses. And then um, Sister Alicia, be up after, after Mr. Moses. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, you guys have been hearing a lot from me recently, mostly about uh, technical issues related to Community Lighthouse. 
In fact, most of my career, really since 2008, I've been working on developing and financing solar projects and more since about 2014, solar and battery storage projects. I've been uh, buying and selling projects for years. And I have a really strong understanding of what the criteria is, the underwriting requirements are for project investors to, to invest in community solar projects. Um, the, the rules that you're considering are, are critical and important for, for uh, allowing investment to flow into Orleans Parish for these uh, incredibly valuable and, and worthwhile assets. So I'm in full support of, of this resolution and the, and the changes that will be considered. Thank you. Thank you. Sister Alicia. Followed by Myron Katz. Good morning, council members. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sister Alicia Costa with the Sisters of the Holy Family of New Orleans. And we have been a part of this community since 1842, before the Emancipation Proclamation, when a free woman of color, Venerable Henriette DeLille, was determined to help the poor and powerless. Similar to Mother uh, Teresa of Calcutta, she and her companions took the elderly slaves thrown out into the street because they could no longer help the fields or work for their master. They founded schools to teach our youth as well. And this mission continues today, even with our aging and reduced membership. Our mission is to serve the poor and we seek ways to continue to strengthen them, to grow and provide for themselves. I want to announce the latest strategy in our artist's 180 year history to accomplish that mission. The Sisters of the Holy Family owns a 22 acre plot of land off Dwyer Road. You look at this, this gives you a map of that property. We want to use that land for community solar project as part of our work with Together New Orleans. The initial resolution for the solar community solar project did not produce one, not one such project as intended. Thus, maybe some rules need to change to make it feasible for investors to embark upon such projects. We Sisters of the Holy Family are willing to help bring about that goal. And I wanna recognize our councilman, Oliver Thomas, uh, who have been much of a support for the sisters. We the sisters cannot work as we used to because of our aging membership, but we still minister in other ways to support our mission to the poor, whether in New yes, Orleans sir. East. That's your time, that sister. Thank you so Thank much. You. Appreciate you. Myron Katz, followed by uh, Greg Kasparich. I think, that, did I pronounce it right? Okay. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Following Hurricane Katrina, the city of New Orleans created a New Orleans Energy Policy Task Force, and one of its 10 recommendations was community solar. It was invented here, and nothing happened from 2007 to 2018, and we knew at the time, and it was made perfectly clear, that the resolution on the table would only help low income, and it would do a poor job of that, and that's why Building Science Innovators and Pro Energy, it's 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 new, the company that now promotes the rate design we invented in 2015 um, did not participate in that process. And it's badly flawed um, remuneration, which you call time tariff. The remuneration that ProRate provides is completely subsidy free, unlike net metering. And it isn't, doesn't just pay for energy, it pays for power. But the yardstick of success is not the tariff. The yardstick of says it's two yardsticks. Are we going to provide a way which is a national standard of lowering a home, a low income customer's bill by more than 50% because they have a community solar relationship? And that is, no one's talking about it. The pro rate has been talking about it. And so has the CCSA, the Coalition of Community Solar Advocates, in their testimony. The process that we've gone through in this docket has been appalling. The judge doesn't even know the prorate that produced the recommendation to promote tariffs. In the last three months, when we were given opportunity to participate and suggest comments, 
There was never any suggestion in the docket that made by anyone except for Entergy that the proposal to improve the tariff was negatively appreciated. And yet, before today, yesterday, it was clear the momentum was that tariffs was off the table. Tariffs have been on the table from the get-go, from MEI, from prorate, from together in New Orleans. That's your time, Mr. Katz. Thank we you so much. We need to go that way. Thank you. Greg Kasparich, <laughs> please, please pronounce your last name correctly. <laughs> Yes, Perez. Oh, got it. Thank you. Good morning, council members, and thank you. Um, I want to show you what's really at stake here. This is a, a map of what Southeast Louisiana would look like with no climate action in about 60 to 70 years. New Orleans being essentially like Dulac, Louisiana is now the end of a essentially string of land with no access by highways or railroads, essentially an uninvestable location. So there is a lot at stake here today. And there's an old saying, and I wanna remind us all about that. God helps those who help themselves. Mm -hmm. And community solar won't solve the world's problems, but it will be our statement and New Orleans should take the lead nationally on this. We have more at stake than any other city in the United States with the possible exception of Miami Beach about our future and the future of, of, of this issue. So please, this is not asking you to solve homelessness. We're not asking you to solve gun violence in America. We're asking you to make community solar a, a, an ongoing, viable project in New Orleans. And I support the efforts of the council to make this happen. And I urge you to be, to think outside the box and to remember really what is at stake here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gasparis. Aaron, online comment? Yes, ma'am. We have one online comment from Jerry Cook II. He says, Entergy is collectively a $17 billion company. Have they looked internally at an area where they can be more efficient prior to requesting increases from their customers? Why don't they understand the residential solar opportunity in communities as they have in New York? How about adopting net metering for solar panels? This would not only reduce costs, but also allow additional power for the entire energy grid. That is the online comment. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, so with that, I will make a motion to approve the resolution. Seconded by Councilmember Harris. Your machine's not working? Okay. Uh, six yeas, no nays. All right, that takes us to item number three, which is a, a utility assistance agreement. You all may recall that over the past several years, the council has taken um, several steps to assist Entergy customers with their utility payments. During the COVID pandemic, we launched what we call the Council CARES program and provided $6 million in bill relief to Entergy customers, creating about, um, from what I remember, it was about $400 uh, per customer at that time. That's okay. Yeah. And then um, last summer, we also did, uh, uh, we dealt with the gas arrearages as well with the help of um, the Alliance for Affordable Energy. And we wiped out about $2 million worth of arrearages for gas customers. And so now we're, we're doing what we call a Council Cares 2.0. Um, this is providing $3 million in uh relief for utility bills. It'll once again be administered through uh, the group Total Community Action, who helped us administer um, his, a, a variety of different projects. So that's what this does. I do have one comment. Jesse George, come on up. Uh, yes, thank you. Jesse George, once again, on behalf of the Alliance for Affordable Energy, uh, while we're certainly supportive of efforts to relieve uh, unafford unaffordable bill bills and arrearages, uh, I'd like to reiterate, um, and I've already told Andrew this, what I'm going to say, that until we pair debt forgiveness and arrearage management with deep energy efficiency improvements, we are trying to drain a bathtub with the faucet running. Uh, we are throwing money and you're going to have to continue appropriating millions of dollars every year to throw basically down the toilet 
until we start keeping people out of arrears in the first place by making their homes more energy efficient. Uh, I'll remind you that the council last year in February 2022 initiated a working group to establish a citywide arrearage management program that uh, the Alliance submitted a proposal that would do exactly what I've just described. And that working group has gone nowhere. Uh, and here we are again, basically handing $3.2 million to Intergy uh, that they probably would not otherwise be able to collect. Um, and people are getting no energy efficiency improvements in return. So again, just wanna stress that we need to take a, a holistic and comprehensive uh, view of this problem and stop throwing money at the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse, appreciate that. Council Member Knox. Uh, I'd just like to make a brief comment about this proposal. Uh, as many of you recall, last year when we were dealing with Energy New Orleans and their proposal to offer billing credits to individuals based on their stakeholders, we offered that perhaps a better avenue to make those credits available would have been total community action. Um, we made that recommendation last year because they have an impeccable reputation for working with the community, particularly people who are elderly and don't have access to um, technology or other uh, typical ways of getting the word out and getting access to resources. The council was very intentional in partnering with TCA to do this particular program because TCA has a reputation for meeting people where they are and for providing resources year round to those in need. So if and when we have credits available, they are the most appropriate body to go out and make the community aware of what's available to them to provide some relief, as well as, as, well as making sure that there will be accessibility and accessing those resources. So I know they're not here today, but they have been a tremendous partner for this council in the city. And we really appreciate the work they've been doing on a variety of issues. Thank you. Thank you, Council President Morrell. Any online comment, Aaron? All right, no online comment. Uh, with that, I will make a motion to uh, approve this ordinance. Seconded by Council Member Jeruso. I've got five yeas, no nays. Thank you. And that brings us now to item number four, which is the presentation on city vehicle fleet. Is Courtney presenting that one? Jonathan or Courtney? Come on up. Hey, Mr. Montano, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, thank you for this ability to present. I think this is great and exciting news and, and good advent forward uh, from our last presentation. Um, just wanted to give a, a quick brief update and then hand it over to the experts um, to my right and my left, Dan and Courtney. Uh, we have been making significant headway with our fleet replacement strategies, our fleet maintenance strategies, and most importantly and acutely for this particular committee, our EV stations and our EV vehicles, which is absolutely the, the wave and the need for the future. And we're encouraged and um, heartened to really be able to present some of the progress, albeit not as significant as we would love. Uh, availability has been somewhat scarce, but we are still making momentum and movement. And uh, the team surrounding me is certainly on that same uh, plan and progress. So thank you for the time to present. I'll now either turn it over to Dan or Courtney um, to really get into some of the details and happy to address any questions thereafter. Great. Thanks. Yep. Whoever wants to start. Hey, Courtney. Sorry. Hey guys, Courtney Story, Chief Administrative Office. Just give you a quick update on the new 10 electric vehicles that we brought onto our fleet um, this last month. We have 10 fully electric Chevy Bolts. Um, they are currently being charged using level one chargers, which is not ideal, which is why Dan and the ORS team is going to talk to you a little bit more about our plan to get level two and three chargers um, available at our city locations as soon as possible. 
Um, these vehicles were assigned to three of them, one to NOPD specifically for use for the supplemental police patrols in the French Quarter. Two went to safety and permits, one to code enforcement, one to the historic districts, one to the Office of Resilience and Sustainability, and the mayor's office at large as a pool vehicle. One went to parks and parkways, and the last went to Mosquito Termite and Rodent Control Board. So um, we are very excited. This is a picture of them at our EMD fleet. The departments are excited. They've um, expressed a lot of excitement from using them and they're you know, excited to get that charging infrastructure in place. All right, good morning, council members. Uh, just a few updates on the EV charger. Uh, situation going on right now. Um, as we talked about last time, that we have the charger pilot program with Entergy, the installations of which are near wrapping up of the uh, 25 locations that are being installed with level two chargers. Uh, 20 of them are now completely installed and active, ready for use. Uh, and the remaining five are in uh, plan review and should be uh, installed in the coming weeks. Uh, parallel to that, Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development. Uh, their EV infrastructure program to install uh, DC fast chargers is currently accepting applications. This is the, the first round of applications to that program. It's part of uh, the NEVI program, one of the funding programs from the IIJA federal infrastructure bill. Uh, so they're accepting applications through the end of April, another five weeks or so. Uh, they anticipate the grant awards from that program to be made this summer, probably around July and installation of those uh, fast chargers to begin in the fall of this year or, or early next year. Uh, those installations are gonna be targeted along, targeted along what are referred to as the alternative fuel corridors. That's essentially the, the major uh, highways around the state. So in our region, I-10, I-610, uh, US-90, the, the West Bank Expressway, uh, and then a, a little further out from the core of the city, um, I-55 and I-59. Uh, regarding the, the efforts of the Office of Resilience and Sustainability, um, we're taking a multi-pronged approach on developing uh, the fleet transition plan uh, in accordance with the council adopted ordinance, uh, as well as the strategic plan for EV adoption uh, by the city itself and within the city broadly. Uh, we've partnered with the Electrification Coalition. They are um, a nonprofit organization providing us some technical support. Um, in identifying uh, the total cost of ownership around vehicles uh, to inform that transition plan. Uh, we are going to be hiring a FUSE fellow. Uh, th that individual will be starting in about a month on May 1st, uh, and we'll be working with our team on this project specifically. Uh, we'll be moving forward with the RFP uh, to select a consultant to work with our office to develop that strategic plan. Um, uh, later this spring. And then finally, we're also currently advertising uh, for an open position within our office, a transportation policy and program manager. Uh, and that will, again, be another way to add to the capacity of our office. Uh, and that person will also be uh, working on our EV efforts, uh, along with Greg and myself. That's where we are all happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, um, Gilbert. Uh, Council Member Harris. Sure, thank you um, for your work on this. I do have a concern about the chargers and have heard from constituents about the chargers. Um, there's no signage. So people are blocking the chargers with gas combustible cars. Is there any way, and I saw Joe Threat here earlier to either mark it with green or put some signage up so that it says only EV charging cars can park in certain areas where the chargers are located? So uh, current city code does not allow us to do that. So there would have to be an ordinance change uh, to allow us to designate on-street parking as uh, electric vehicle only. Why don't we work on that together and get that <laughs> up Definitely. and running? Okay, great. Thank you. Happy to assist in any way, Council Member Harris. Um, a, a couple of questions. Um, Dan, I don't know if you, you can answer this or Mr. Montano, but how do we compare with other cities in the Gulf South when it comes to EV uh, infrastructure deployment? Um, I can't answer that right now. I'd have to do some more research, look at some of our peer cities and get back to you on, on how we're comparing. Um, 
both infrastructure wise or just on the general adoption. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be, I think that'd be great to see, you know, how we're doing. Um, and if, if, if we're moving too slowly, uh, I'd like to see what other cities are doing so that they're, that they're moving at a much faster pace. Um, when it comes to the procurement of, of electric vehicles, I know it's, it's hard to procure vehicles at all, but is it, is it, is it by any chance even harder to procure EV uh, or electric vehicles? It has been, yes, these were ordered from a dealership in Texas that another city backed out of. So that's why we were able to oh, procure them. But typically the lead time on producing them is substantial. Um, there are a lot more electro electronic components that go into electric vehicles than in a traditional combustion engine. And the supply chain shortages from COVID haven't ramped back up quite yet. So we expect that delay to roll into 2025. Gotcha. So I guess that would require even additional planning on our side then. And I know that the team is working with the Office of Procurement to join the um, Electric Vehicle Collaborative. I don't know, if Dan, you can provide a little bit more information about that, but that should also open up our ability to purchase EVs outside of the state as well. The 10 were purchased under the emergency declaration, but that you know won't be in place forever. So we're going to need a longer term strategy to bring those vehicles into the into the state. The city. Got it. Got it. Oh, uh, yes. Our, our procurement office here in the city is working with the state procurement office um, to follow the steps necessary to be able to join that collaborative and, and open another avenue for potentially sourcing vehicles. Okay. Council member Green, did you have a question? That was actually my question. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. So. All right. Uh, any other questions? Seeing no other questions, do you have any public comment on this? Nope. Okay. Well, then that'll do it. We appreciate your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next is uh, a presentation on Lincoln Beach, an update. I believe Mr. Threat is uh, presenting. And Ms. Robles as well. Mr. Thread and Ms. Robles, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, as we all know, this is a really important um, project that we all know needs to be prioritized. And we're very excited now that it'll be fully funded as well. So um, oh, thank you. That's great. So whenever you all are ready, whoever wants to begin, please do so. Good morning. Oh. Oh, really <laughs> Good morning. I'm Sharon Robles. I'm the project manager for the Lincoln Beach project. And just with, um, this week, we've finalized, well, actually tomorrow, I guess, is when the formal ordinance goes through. But we will be move, um, shifting funds to Lincoln Beach so that rather than originally what we were planning on doing is opening it up incrementally with incremental funding um, and different reimbursable um, resources, now the administration has put together all of the um, funds on the front end so that as we, uh, we can actually build everything out at one time. So this is kind of like the big picture. You see that? Big picture of what we're looking for of how we've re reallocated some funding. We're uh, primarily using bond funding. We do still have access to, right now it's um, the BP funding. We have 4.3 million that's actually available right now and that's reimbursable. We will start moving forward. We had a meeting actually last week with Treasury to figure out how we go about and draw down those funds. So we'll be constantly using um, the funds from the bond money to, uh, to actually like bankroll the rest of the project until we can get it out. And then um, eventually there will be a total of $9.3 million available from the BP settlement. Um, again, that's a pretty time consuming process to draw down those funds, but that we do intend, intend to use them. Um, by shifting the, uh, the, the money um, from the grant reimbursable projects, we are able to move forward into like the bigger construction projects. And originally we've, or in earlier times, we've talked about how we would build a bridge, like for example, later on, now it looks like the most cost-effective way for us to build um, a bridge would be when we're actually trying to get the utilities over um, in the front. So it's gonna change some of the order that we're going um, to develop the, the program. Uh, I am looking to have the RFP out in about a month uh, for public bid, um, but everything is moving forward. We have about $24.6 million to move this project forward and we're pretty we're real excited about this project uh, moving forward uh, I think it's some other monies that might be uh, in the works as far as uh, appropriation from our congressional uh, delegation uh, for five million dollars also uh, the beaches uh, a candidate for the national registry uh, so, I mean, it's a lot of exciting things going on right there. Uh, before some of the money was moved because we looked, naturally we have to have our bonds 
spent down for my last bond sale, uh, 2021 bond sale. We have to spend down 85% of those bonds, the three, uh, 500 million uh, by next year. So we were trying to be good stewards of that money to make sure that we're still tax exempt moving forward. And we really the $24.6 million or some, most of that money will still be sitting on the shelf next year, but we're gonna carve out that area for the beach so we can move forward on that project. And if you could, uh, can you go through the uh, other elements today that we have? Yeah. Well, you could, I don't have the whole, whole presentation. No, that. Oh, okay. Oh, um, so the master plan RFP, we should have that out in about a month. Um, and then the uh, the student who, well, she was an architecture student when she first applied to put Lincoln Beach on the historic register. Um, now she's graduated and is a full on architect, but she's still moving forward to help us get that designation. That date has been set for May 25th. Um, so I'm looking, I'm still looking for guidance on whether it's we go to be supportive in uh, Baton Rouge to help support that um, uh, placement on the historic register or whether it's just an online, um, but we'll keep you posted. There's a, a bunch of people who are really excited about the idea of that actually getting placed on the historic register that will also open us up for some additional funding. Um, there's some some funding allocations that are available if you're a historic place. Um, we have the 30 percent uh, design plans ready for about 10 different elements of the pro of the project, and we should be getting 60% design in the next couple weeks, so that we can be out to bid with those project. I mean, with those elements of the project um, this summer, we are looking to um, to have the fence, um, like to have the the portion of the parking lot. It's 10 acres on the. Uh, the flood side, we're looking to have that cleared next month and we'll be installing um, a gate so that we can start maintaining that and mowing that uh, several times a year, which is also in line with the um, minimizing blight in New Orleans East. And then uh, we'll continue to look for funding uh, sources as we are uh, starting the application process, which is happen happening simultaneously with some of this other work. Oh yeah. Okay. So one of the larger elements that keeps on coming up is actually the traffic on Hain. Yeah. So when we're talking about Hain, um, right in front of Lincoln Beach, we're doing the preliminary studies that we've done are showing that it won't it, uh, just a pedestrian island to allow people to safely go from one side of Hain to the other side of Hain. That's not ideal in terms of um, people people moving across and walking at certain at speeds. You know, walking at pedestrian speeds. So what we are looking is probably extending the length of that for at least a couple of blocks, and then long term, the city is working working with um, DOTD and the Regional Planning Commission to actually uh, fund a study that would, um, it's called a road diet, would very likely recommend that the traffic on Hain from Downman to Paris would be reduced. So it would only be one lane of vehicular traffic and then also probably a bike lane in, in either way. So uh, we're already working on that draft of that, uh, that scope of work already and RPC would fund it. It takes about nine months to a year to have it completed but ideally what that would mean is that when we're about to open lincoln beach to the public on a regular basis we would also have slower traffic which helps improve pedestrian access and safety and will also help um, to minimize the drag racing issue that we're, that we know is happening out there yeah and council member of uh, moreno and morell you know to get a letter of support from the council to Absolutely. kind of speed up that process uh, with DOTD at the state uh, to get that study done, that feasibility study on traffic yeah. would help us a lot. Consider it done. Into, Absolutely. Yes, okay. And we'll draft. Uh, thank you. Make it even you. easier. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, first, I just want to say thank you to both of you, um, in particular, you, Mr. Threat. I, I think we, we kind of need a backstory as to as to how we came to the, the fully funding of um, this project, and I'll take you back uh, several weeks ago when um, it was a Sunday, and I received calls from some um, advocates of, of Lincoln Beach who were pretty distressed that they'd seen that there was $5 million that had been taken from the Lincoln Beach project and then utilized to uh, fund the Gordon Plaza. Uh, relocation and in, in, in the solar facility uh, there. And so then that caused certainly a lot of confusion. It caused me to be confused as well because I went and pulled back the Gordon Plaza ordinances and 
the money that was supposed to be utilized for that was uh, to be taken from uh, projects that were stormwater management related and also streets and roads that for some reason it could, could be um, delayed. So Lincoln Beach was never part of any ordinance that, that we had seen. And, and then, you know, looking at, the, at, a, at another uh, recent ordinance that we saw, the, the Lincoln Beach money was actually um, put back through another ordinance that passed in uh, January. But once again, in this particular ordinance, there was, there was uh, money that came from streets and roads that went back into this project. So bottom line, I guess the point of all of this is not only was the community confused, the council members were confused. I think even you know members of, of the administration were uh, confused to as to where everything um, was because there were emails explaining how th the funding was going, but then another email would contradict that one. So, you know, Mr. Threat, when I came to you and Mr. Montano and said, "Let's just fund this whole program. Let's just let's show the community that we really do prioritize uh, this project and let's fully fund it." and I have to tell you, you and Mr. Montano, you all have been champions and you all said, absolutely, it makes sense. And I am so incredibly grateful to you all for, for seeing how important it is to fully fund uh, this program. And, um, you know, I know it, it, it took us, you all moving uh, a lot of different parts, but you got it done. And so just for certainty, I just want to make sure that none of the money that's going to this Lincoln Beach project, and as we know, this ordinance will be moving forward. It's actually next week, Ms. Robles, um, that none of it's coming from the Gordon Plaza project. <laughs> no, and I can tell you, I mean, it's a challenge for us because, you know, I was in charge of the bond sale for 2021. And when we put that bond sale together, put it out to the voters, we had categories. And we also sent a list of projects that we had planned for each district to the Board of Lit and to our bond council uh, to go out to sale. But since that bond sale, it's been some moving targets. I mean, it's been Gordon yep. Plaza, it's OJC, the jail, yeah, $30 million, 35 Gordon Plaza, 22 Sewer and Water Board. That's an impact Absolutely. on the other projects. So I've got my folks, I'll take responsibility, but my folks in a back order office, I'm telling them to find money for yep. these other buckets that were not in our original plan and they were moving money. So I think we got a handle on it right now. We'll discuss it some more uh, when we bring up capital projects tomorrow of where we are. And then when inflation and supply chain management, our bids coming in high on projects. I mean, it's a challenge right now trying to take those bond monies that we sold the 300 million. Uh, we're getting planning to sell another 200 million here starting to yep. work up in July. Uh, to make sure that all the projects, most of the projects in the in the uh, districts are funded. So, you know, it's a hiccup, but we got the money where it needs to be right now. Hey, no doubt about it. And, and I'm glad we were able to work together to, to find this solution and really appreciate you and, yeah. and your hard work. Council Member Green, followed by Thomas. My, counts, my uh, um, comments are going to be very brief, and I just, because um, I'm going to defer mostly to Councilman Thomas, but I just wanted to say that as a member of the Lakefront Management Authority, which was formerly the levy board, I remember that we had discussion some time ago relative to Lincoln Beach. And um, at the one time, the Lakefront Management Authority wanted to do a swap with uh, the city um, to develop this particular parcel. And I'm just pleased that it's that the Cantrell administration um, kind of maybe heard the request, but stayed with the fact that the city needed to develop this parcel. Um, and I'm just pleased to see that we're at the point right now where that money is available. I do want to commend the members of the community and they'll speak for themselves. I bet we have a couple of yellow cards in, but we have some members of the community who were very, very concerned and wanted to see Lincoln Beach developed. In fact, went out there before there was talk about clean up and just cleaned it up on their own, went out there on a regular basis. And um, I just want to say, as we move forward and I move to Councilman Thomas, who's been intimately involved with this um, project from the beginning and for other years, that um, this is an example of community involvement that makes things happen. I've seen it happen in many other places um, through the district that I represent, but it's an example of when the community comes forward and kind of raises the profile of an issue and also puts their equity into it, their sweat equity into it. 
that good things can result. So just wanted to mention that to the community members who are here and who might be watching in New Orleans East. Um, certainly we know that New Orleans East matters. And one of the reasons is because there's a lot of involvement and in civic engagement by the rep that are um, residents of the community. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Council Member. And I, I know this is really commendable. I'm sure we'll hear uh, from a, a bunch of folks here, a couple of uh, residents who's been really babysitting and taking care Absolutely. of that beach for many, many years, cleaning yes. it. And Council Member uh, Thomas, I know you're instrumental. We've been working a long time on this project, uh, especially with the cleanup and everything else on the beach. So, you know, it's really a, a, a good time for the neighborhood. Council Member Thomas. Wow, what a wonderful day. I mean, after years of neglect and years of being a second thought and an afterthought, Dawn New Orleans East is finally front and center with everybody. That's This is, uh, if we were in church, I'd say this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. The beautiful thing about this is that the people who started this effort has given everybody a wagon that they can jump on now. The hard work uh, to say that that Black Beach, especially now that we know what happened in California, there and that historical significance. But Mr. Threat, when you and I have talked and when we've talked and uh, with the mayor and, and our working committee, I, I, I was never confused. Uh, there was never any confusion with us. Maybe there may have been some confusion in terms of the funding categories and the formulas, but the commitment that you made, that the mayor made, and that the administration made every step of the way was that the project would be fully funded, but that we would move in phases. And that we would not allow that while we were waiting on, it's in close, the bond market to change, and maybe the, some of the funding formulas to change, we would totally wait. And we can see that now with the parking lot and the work that started there. Uh, the fact that my staff coordinated the cleanup effort uh, with the levy board. And then the last two uh, times we went out there to check on the, the utilities. And so the only question that I have right now, and, and, and man, God bless this council for, uh, you know, to have a teamwork on an issue that this community deserves and that the people who started this reserves. Where are we now with the CTV in terms of the utilities? Because the question there was, can we use those existing utilities or are we gonna to have to totally replace? And you know, the last working meeting was on the walkway and how the utilities would be carried over. Now, is there a chance to use those existing utilities, maybe put some of that money back into the project? Has that project been, has that report been completed yet? Um, so the drainage line, we, we do expect to be checking in the next month or so. Okay. That work will coincide when we have the, um, the the floodgate will be open, the tunnel will be drained, and then we'll do the assessment of the drainage lines. Real question is whether or not we also take the sewer and the water lines overhead as part of whether it's a utility bridge, whether it's actually a pedestrian bridge. Um, so we don't know that answer yet, but we, we still have to assess what condition they're in. And then the... Uh, uh, other issue is with uh, 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 Norfolk Southern, uh, the railroad, and uh, when uh, we met with them and uh, walked that site with them, uh, they committed to participate at some level. Where are they now with their commitment to financially be a partner? So we, we did write a formal request of them, and it included okay. not only um, permission to, to go over um, and have, like, for example, if we build a bridge, there would have right. to be air rights. And so we asked if they would waive that. They have that specific mm -hmm. request. And they also have a request in general in terms of permitting requirements to waive those. We don't have a confirmation in, in what capacity they're going to be participating yet, but they've already expressed that they absolutely intend to support us. Um, in terms of my most aggressive follow-up, um, I, they've been, Norfolk Southern's been pretty busy. And so I have not followed up with them in the last um, couple oh, yeah, of years. Well, Norfolk Southern, <laughs> so, so, my goodness, well, they committed to be a financial partner. Yes, and I think- uh, Let's make sure we nail them down, especially now. Uh, they need friends right now, uh, especially given what they're dealing with in Ohio. So I think this is a good time uh, to, to nail them down. Two other things. 
and then we'll get back to the work we've been doing. Uh, uh, the cooperative endeavor agreement with the community, you know, because we have a, a lot of projects that are funded, but they get funded and then the community's not involved. And the last time I broke a meeting between you and the committee and their representatives, it was how do we put together a formal ingredient, a formal agreement so that the people who were there uh, in the beginning, uh, now that we're fully funded, uh, now that we're talking master plan, now that we're talking utilities, now that we're clearing that site, how do we make sure that they are part of the process uh, structurally in, in terms of an agreement part of the process so that no contract goes out, no review goes out, no changes goes out without them being at the table, not in political meetings or and all that, but when the work starts, that's what I'm interested in. So that anything that goes out, they're part of a working group that either approves it or disapproves it. Where are we with that? So the CEA for, yes. uh, with New Orleans for Lincoln Beach, they have a draft of it and we're, or we're sharing it. I'm right behind me, Bliss is mm -hmm. right behind me. And they have a draft of it that they were sharing with an attorney last week. And once they have that review back, they were going to send it back to the city for us to review. Mm -hmm. So they've been working on it uh, for a couple of weeks. We'd had a meeting to talk okay. about it maybe two months ago. And then, and then lastly, and then thank uh, everyone. Thank Councilmember Morrell. I remember Councilmember Morrell had one of the first hearings here just to make sure that that works. So you can see this is a, a project that everybody's on board with. And after years of it not moving forward, even though it was before this body, even though it was before the city, we finally have it where the community has said is enough is enough and everyone's on the same page. After years, the last thing is, uh, Mr. Bennett, uh, uh, Bliss, and, and, and Mr. Reggie talked about as we phase this thing in, using that parking lot as a cultural open air market, where though the utilities in the other side may not be ready while we're doing the other work, but we can begin to set a cultural and historical uh, foundation using that open air market, which, uh, which is next door. Are we, as we're clearing that field, are we mindful of preparing it to be used so that cultural activity can actually start there while we're working on the other part, because I think I thought that was a brilliant idea, Sage, in that even though the beach will be under a lot of work, man, we could set a whole cultural foundation, uh, you know, on the parking lot and the departures being cleared. Are we mindful while we're clearing it to prep it and prepare it for that? Yes. Okay. Well, well, all right. Yeah, and I think, uh, uh, Council Member Thomas, that's one uh, reason that I asked the question about trying to uh, expedite the DOTD traffic right. study is gonna be uh, crucial. Uh, if we do do something in the parking lot, you know, the traffic and safety concerns for the and, residents. And, and, and I, want, I want you guys to do me a favor. I want you to take the confusion out of it. Construct an agreement with the, with the, with the committee and the, so that there's a notification with them, right? Because as elected officials here, man, we're working on crime, housing, uh, 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 gosh, quality of life, traffic, affordable housing, dumping, litter, and all of that stuff. The, the group who's concerned about this, but it's their singular, their most important, important focus. And I'm gonna keep it real. While I'm working on all them old hundred things in my mind, it, it may be a priority, but in terms of the order of work that we're doing, there's so many other things. So please construct this, this the agreement with the committee so that at every step of the way while your staff is working. And I don't know if that makes sense. I'm, I'm kind of learning this stuff. No, it makes again, sense. Right? And, I, and it's, it's the same model that we're going to use for a municipal auditorium to where we, we sit down with the, the committees and organizations right, right. So, that are taking care of that land. So please do me a favor. Formalize an agreement with the people who are on this every day. That way it takes the politics out of it, it takes the confusion out of it, and it takes the miscommunication out of it. Because then the, the communication, and then the agreement will be directly with them. That's the one of the most important things that can happen right now, to know that they are institutionalized in this, 
so that they don't have to count on me to tell them what's going on. They don't have to count on any budget formula debacles for what's going on. That every time a communication goes out, every time there's a meeting about how you're gonna use their money and the public's money, that they're automatically part of it. Please do that for me. As important as you think I am, I'm not more important than the people who've been working on this project in the community. Thank you. Councilman Morrell. Thank you. Um, I want to begin with a point that Councilman Green made. I think it's important. So he said he served on the Lakefront Management Authority. Uh, I created the Lakefront Management Authority in 2007, 2008. And it's a tale of two cities, really, because the Lakefront Management Authority, which spans from Lakeview through New Orleans East, is state-owned property. And after Hurricane Katrina, when we dissolved the levy board, all those state-owned properties were left in limbo, and they were stuck with the Division of Administration. All of that property began to immediately have grass issues, trash issues, and the like. And those communities came together and said, this is completely unacceptable. The state is not honoring its obligations. And through a tremendous amount of work with those communities, we created the Lakefront Management Authority to allow those communities to have determination over those lakefront assets. And that is why you saw it went from a grass too high, you could hide a body, trash everywhere to the clean space you see today. The difference between that track of land and this track of land is this a city owned? And I, I, this is no, no disrespect to you, Mr. Threx. I know you're stepping in a problem that's been a problem for many years, but the city is a horrible landlord. The city is one of the largest owners of blight in the city of New Orleans, the city owned property. And though I appreciate where we are here today, and those numbers are tremendous, I think that the Councilman Thomas's point, a lot of that is because the people of New Orleans East, in particular, the individuals working on this project have refused to be silent on the state of operations. I think that the Councilman Moreno's point, it is hard to differentiate confusion from a lack of urgency. I think that in particular with the Lincoln Beach project, people have been told to work on this project, like everyone has said, who pick up the trash that's not picked up and the like that, it's coming, it's on the way, the money's there. And I think it is jarring for people when they think that they're getting certain sums of money to then see on paper, the money's not there. And I think the difference today is that we're committing on paper, here is the specific money, because if you do not give people who are working on projects like Lincoln Beach the receipts to say, here is the receipt, here's where this pot of money is coming from, it has to be extremely disorienting and disappointing whenever they think they've got a pot of money. And then when you see a new advertisement for a project moving forward, they see their pot of money getting poached to move to another pot of money. I think that what's more important than anything else today for people like Reggie and Sage is that if we're committing that these pots of money are for this project, we cannot be moving money around from project to project. Because the fact that Lincoln Beach has laid this fallow for this long, that this city property has been mismanaged for this long, it is getting to the point where they have borderline PTSD with promises of that, we're gonna spend this money and get this project moving forward when they can't even guarantee the trash is gonna to be picked up when they pick it up. So I appreciate all the work today. I appreciate in particular the work of the advocates and council members, in particular council member, uh, Moreno and Councilmember Thomas and trying to get us to this point. But if these are the pots of money that we're committing from this, to this project, we cannot move this money around. This has to be this money for this project. And honestly, I'm surprised at this point, we, we don't have something similar to a lakefront management authority for assets like Lincoln Breach out there that could be community driven and community run because 
that was the only way the lakefront moved. When we took politicians out the mix and made the neighborhoods and the stakeholders, the people who drove LMA, LMA got stuff done. Right. It didn't get stuff done because politicians were on it. It got stuff done because people like Pearl Cantrell and Eugene Green were on it. So that's just my suggestion. Thank you. Great suggestion. Thank you, uh, Council President Morales. Uh, let me take public comment. Sage, come on up. Sage Michael, followed by Don Abair, then Reggie Ford and Tillman Hardy. Yeah, um, thank you all. I don't want to hold y'all too long. Y'all uh, know me. Uh, y'all know my dedication to the redevelopment of the site. Um, basically, um, we. Um, my goal is to bring everyone together to work in unison for the project. I would do that continuously throughout the projects. I've attempted to do that in the past, mm -hmm. about a year ago, to create a, some type of council, some type of steering committee. Mm -hmm. But we have the. We made relationships with everyone with Troy Carr in the federal, Jason Hughes. Um, and Joe Boy in the state, entire city council made um, roads with community members, community groups, nonprofits, and funders. It's my goal to bring all those people together to work in unison. Um, you mentioned Task Force, you mentioned LMA. Uh, look, one band, one sound. Uh, we know who really, like the three amigos are here <laughs> as the community uh, really spirit this project. The issue is this, it's true honest collaboration and co-creation with community not hard. Elephant in the room is um, our project manager, Ms. Sharon Robert, is not as engaged as need to be on this Black historical project. I've invited her to coffee, to drink, and have a, a chat with her. We have to have that collaborative relationship. I'm a community coordinator organizer for this project. So Ms. Sharon and I must have a working relationship together. Right. I don't know what the holdup is. When I first met on the beach, she told me I couldn't be there. I think everyone knows I'm not going anywhere. And we must work together. I feel as though I'm a God-led mission and I bring the whole council together on this mission. Yeah. I bring the mayor on this mission. Absolutely. Bring everyone. So I'm not gonna hold you all with this, you know, speaking over the mic. I only have two minutes to speak on this project. And I think that's like ridiculous that the work and sacrifices I put in this project, not comparative, but this cannot be a mayoral project, not gonna be a city council project. This is a community project. Absolutely. And I want to thank the community who have stood with me yes. by and forth through everything. Because believe me, when we start this, people pray for me. They bless me. They bless the land. We're returning this land to our community, to those indigenous people that you see on that, on that symbol of New Orleans, back to the black community, and to our Latin friends, the Hondurans. Thanks to everyone. Thank, thank you. you. I've used my two minutes. That's all I have today. Thank you. Appreciate you, Sage. Thank you so much. Don Abair. Don, why don't you come on up? followed by Reggie Ford. Good morning, Good everyone. Morning. I'm Dawn Abair, and I'm president of the East New Orleans Neighborhood Advisor Commission. I want to say I really um, got into this project like over the past year or so, but these guys that have been working on this, I give them kudos because they yes. have done a great job. And I do want to thank the city for helping with a large cleanup last August. Uh, it, it was amazing. I said the trash that was back there. But I'm hoping that the funding that has been given, I was really happy to read that news break because it's needed. This is an historical site. It is past due for renovations. So I'm hoping that everything that has been promised, uh, that the uh, work will, will start like immediately or next month to see some type of clearing out. Because I do agree that if you clean out that parking, uh, what we call a parking lot across the street, it will give light to the project and people will see that something is going on and that the city is fulfilling their promise. So I want to say as a community member, we're hoping that it happens. We're ha happy Bayou Phoenix is coming. So maybe they can uh, start the process simultaneously. So, um, so we're happy. It's not going to be only for the people of New Orleans East, the city of New Orleans and the surrounding communities. So please let's get this going definitely include these guys and female uh, with the work that's being done because it is a community-led effort and it has happened in other communities. So let's keep that up. And as far as the lakefront management goes, um, you know, they are doing a lot of work. Uh, there's been uh, talk, you know, of a punch and train beach and I'm hoping um, that this project definitely moves forward. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Reggie Ford. 
followed by Tillman Hardy. All right, I just want to thank everybody for making this happen and securing this own project for the finance part, portion of it. And thank you, for Sage, for sparking these ideas to get this place done. My own involvement with the project was always the funding source. And I always was like, let's get the buy money because it's tax dollars that the tax people are going to be paying back. District E should be getting something in return for the money they'll be paying back for years and years. Um, and just thank Bliss for staying on a project. So um, my involvement is going to kind of subside. I just wish, you know, moving forward, like y'all said, y'all have involvement with Sharon and Sage and Bliss and them with developing this project. You know, my main thing was the money. Without the money, nothing works. And I just want to thank the council for coming together on this project and fully getting this thing fully funded and all the hard work you've been doing, Helena, the past month, Lord, trying to figure out what was what. And Councilman Thomas for bringing in buy money and requesting in, and that's going out. Um, and in closing, the most important point I heard today was Councilman Thomas talking about the North Folk Southern and getting the permission from the railway to go over under. Sharon, you're the most important person in this room right now. The money is here. It's just gonna be your guidance and your persistence that'll carry this thing through in a in a in a very uh a uh, proficient way. And getting that North Fort Southern thing is the most important thing. And hopefully that's the channels y'all going through and we're working smart and getting this development going with the money that's in place. And um, I'm, I'm just happy that it's finally fully funded and this thing could come to exist. Well, let me say this, uh, young man. Uh, Y'all efforts are going to be memorialized in this piece. This is more than just a political football, man. My mom and my dad and my grandmother, my great grandparents went to Lincoln Beach. My mother told me stories about Lincoln Beach. I saw pictures of those old signs. For some of us, it's life, right? It's a way of life. And your efforts will not subside, whether I'm here or not, or whoever's involved in the future politically. Yeah. You guys are going to be displayed prominently so that your ancestors and your children and your family will know that you may step back because of the agreement and there's other people involved. But if I have any breath of political power in me, you guys are going to be memorialized. And there's going to be something to represent this original, this original com uh, committee. And like you said, the beauty of it now is that after years, you know, this, I mean, this, I, I, we talked about Lincoln Beach on my show three years ago. That was three, three years, years ago. Three years ago. Three years ago. Dang. Three years ago. And then there was a conversation before that, a year, a year or two before that. So the beautiful thing now is that hopefully this is an example of how we can come together on so many other things. But you just know this. Uh, you and this group, y'all are going to be memorialized there because it does not happen without y'all. And I mean that not as an elected official, not as somebody who wants you to vote for me. I mean that as a man. Thank you, man. Thank you. And thank y'all. Yeah, and I, I thank Councilmember Thomas. My intent is that those individuals, Sage, Reggie, Bliss, whoever else is involved, that they're part of that CEA that we put together. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're gonna be. <laughs> Thank you, Reggie. Appreciate you. you. All right, Tillman Hardy. Do we have online comment too? We do? Okay. Hello, Tillman Hardy, Core USA, uh, 6916 Camberley Drive, walking distance to um, Lincoln Beach. I just wanted to uh, make a couple of statements about my concerns on how Lincoln Beach has progressed up to this point. Um, the first time I found out about Lincoln Beach, it was prior to the first cleanup. And um, I reached out to, I was invited to Lincoln Beach by some local young people, uh, maybe two blocks away from Lincoln Beach. Uh, after my uh, run for city council, I think that was 2016. So after that was really rough and I left Carrollton and moved to 
uh, New Orleans East, and some folks invited me over there. And um, I started posting some pictures from Lincoln Beach, and I called Cindy Wynn and um, the mayor, Cantrell, and asked about Lincoln Beach. And they said, uh, well, let, let me look into it. And I'll get back to you. And so when they posted about the $5 million, I posted on my page. And Michael was one of my Facebook friends at the time prior to me blocking him. But he was uh, looking at my page and he forwarded my post and said, hey, we got to go clean up Lincoln Beach and we got to take over this contract. He also said at his first cleanup that I was at, he said that he wanted to embarrass the administration. It was wrong. And it's still wrong. And he and uh, several other people Mr. who were working with you. Oliver Thomas to make money off of these projects. Mr. Hardy, your the political corruption needs to stop. Mr. Hardy, your time's up. Thank you. All right. Let's see. Online comment? Uh, yes, there are three online comments. Ms. Spears asked that I take over for to save her voice. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the first one is from uh, Daisha Greeley. It says the community would like a guarantee of participation and being informed by facilitation of public input process to continue to engage residents in formulating and implementing a plan that truly belongs in the community. Use, use of outreach strategies such as media presentations, public meetings, surveys, digital and workshops throughout the project. The second uh, comment is from Eric Greeley. Uh, it says, meet with Market Umbrella, a community recommendation included representatives to confirm interest in establishing an equitable, diverse, and inclusive market in the parking lots, as well as in the RFP and CEA. Ensure that there are purposeful educational and enrichment opportunities incorporating the historical, cultural, environmental characteristics relevant to the site, incorporating the historic character and cultural significance of the site into new features. Uh, and the third comment is from Tangi Wall. As president of New Orleans East Matters Coalition, Lincoln Beach represents an opportunity for sustainable economic development for our East community, as well as great opportunities for our city and region for increased tourism while recognizing a rich African-American cultural history associated. Those are all the public comments. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. And uh, that completes our presentation then. Thank you so much, Mr. Threat, Mr. Robles, and to all of the community members who are here. We appreciate you. All right, everyone. I'm going to go a little bit out of order now. I'm going to take item number seven next, which is a presentation from JOIN. So let me take that next and I'll turn it over to Council Member Harris on that one. Thank you, uh, Council Member Moreno. So JOIN uh, is uh stands for Jefferson Orleans Irish Channel Neighbors um, Join for Clean Air. It's a multi-parish group that's been advocating for environmental justice for their neighborhood due to uh, purported air pollution from a strip of industrial facilities along the Mississippi River in Jefferson and Orleans Parish. Um, these facilities are located very close to residential neighborhoods on both sides of the river. I've personally met with uh, members of JOIN and my office has sent out emails and letters to both the LDEQ and the EPA to support JOIN and their continued efforts to address noxious odors and air pollution in the Irish Channel and along the Mississippi River. Um, I thought it was important for JOIN to present to this committee um, and hear feedback from other committee members who are on, uh, who serve here. So JOIN, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, council member. Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Justin Vitito. This is Dr. Kim Terrell, and we represent Join for Clean Air. Uh, as the council member just mentioned, we are a volunteer organization, a multi-parish organization. We formed about three years ago in response to uh, our neighborhoods getting inundated with toxic fumes on a regular basis. 
Uh, this came on very rapidly, almost overnight, and it coincided with a facility, a petrochemical storage facility directly across the river from us, uh, less than a mile from most of the Irish Channel, uh, expanding, expanding uh, uh, enormously. Um, this uh, facility uh, deals in sour crude byproducts predominantly, so petrochemicals that are very, very volatile, uh, especially asphalts. So uh, they are on a regular basis loading and unloading barges and trains of asphalt. And when they do this, the fumes are so thick, they inundate our entire neighborhood. They're so thick that they seep into our homes in the middle of the night. They drive us inside when we were trying to enjoy um, being outside uh, last night, Kim and I were preparing for this presentation. We were sitting at parasols and these fumes came in. They started burning our throats. We had to go inside. Um, we did not attempt to rally the neighborhood to get all the folks out here today. Uh, I think we could have probably filled at least half of this place. Uh, uh, we're not here to try to convince everyone of the urgency of this, I think. Um, Council members Moreno and Jeruso, uh, they were here in uh, 2021 when uh, we did bring out the folks. It is hard to forget the gut-wrenching, heartbreaking stories we had and still have, because this is still ongoing, uh, expectant mothers with their nurseries filling with fumes in the middle of the night. Um, we have parents whose children are regularly going to the ER with migraines that are triggered when these fumes seep into their homes. We have people who are surviving cancer. We have people with chronic respiratory problems that their doctors are telling them are from chronic exposure to these types of fumes. I myself am a parent of a five-year-old, which means that it's been three years now, over half of her life, she has lived with a elevated risk of cancer. I had to spend the pandemic with a toddler where we were outside playing on her playground and I have to bring her inside because the fumes are so thick. The amount of stress and anxiety that I feel when the fumes are thick at night and they're seeping into her room, I cannot describe to y'all. When Council Member Harris came into office, she immediately recognized the severity of the situation and began working with us regularly and has been an absolute huge help in holding LDEQ accountable. Uh, she, as she mentioned earlier, she thought it was important for us to uh, speak with y'all. I think this is incredibly important because this problem affects the entire city and uh, pollution doesn't stop at the parish line. It's gonna flow all through here and it's affecting our uh, our city in, in very big ways. Um, so uh, we put together a presentation uh, to give you a, a brief overview of the problem as it has unfolded uh, thus far. Dr. Kim. Thanks. Um, I recognize that it's been a long meeting. I appreciate everybody's time. Um, and I wanna reemphasize the point that Every council member here has constituents who are impacted by industrial emissions from another parish, whether it's St. Bernard Parish, whether it's Jefferson Parish, this is a bigger issue. So our neighborhood kind of mobilized around the strip of industrial facilities directly across the river from us in Jefferson Parish. Um, I live right by Burke Park, which you can kind of see on the map and of an industrial scale asphalt storage facility. What's really important to recognize is that these facilities were built without any public input. So these satellite photos illustrate BWC Harvey, which is like I said, less than a mile from people living um, in uptown New Orleans. And all of these tanks were, were approved by the state without any public hearing, without any public meeting, without any you know, involvement from people who live and are affected by them. Since January, 2019, the undeveloped area kind of on the left was developed into asphalt tanks. And so that really coincided with when this problem became more severe. 
Um, and so we know that, like I said, this was done as a bunch of uh, what DEQ would call insignificant activities. Um, so basically tank by tank approvals that allowed this entire facility to be constructed in piecemeal. Um, and so this is what it looks like right across the river from our homes, right? So the, the big kind of rusty looking tanks on the left are the large new asphalt tanks that they built. Um, and you can see how there's no buffer zone whatsoever between people's homes, businesses, and these large scale industrial operations. We are also working with our neighbors in Jefferson Parish because they're affected by this too. Um, and so what we do have is we have a really good record uh, because people on this side of the river are becoming more and more aware of this problem. And so this is a map. We haven't updated it in a while. It would be, you know, even more densely populated. But each red marker is a complaint that was filed with DEQ about asphalt fumes, um, which DEQ connected to this asphalt storage facility. Um, and, and really, it's kind of common sense too, right? Like if any of y'all have driven on the interstate when they're putting asphalt down, you can smell it before you see it, right? But, and so imagine that on an industrial scale where we're talking about 100 million gallons being stored and transferred without any pollution controls. This is, this is uh, over 1,600 complaints since this began from over 400 separate households. Uh, the, this neighborhood right here accounts for one in three odor complaints in the LDEQ's statewide database. Exactly. Um, and, you know, in our community, we're privileged to have a lot of experts, right? We have scientists, we have financial analysts, um, and so we have a lot of people to crunch the data, including a former um, DEQ scientist who used to work for Utah DEQ. So she put together this graph of complaints. And, you know, this is a nine year period. Um, and you can see that, you know, after they built these asphalt tanks, people started complaining about noxious asphalt fumes. Um, it's, it's really not rocket science. We also have a geographer in the group who created what is called a heat map. So the idea is if, if people, you know, in adjacent blocks are complaining about asphalt fumes, the people who live in between them are probably affected too. So this map illustrates the areas with um, the highest density of complaints, which are directly downwind from BWC Harvey, this new asphalt plant. Um, and at the beginning, DEQ was responsive. They did an investigation and they documented that yes, their staff went there and experienced the same problem. But as soon as this issue started getting media attention, DEQ's position changed. They got real scared to say anything definitive. Um, three months after making that statement, they did another uh, investigation in which some of the complaints were investigated before they were filed, right? That's like investigating a murder before somebody's murdered. It kind of leaves you scratching your head and wondering, you know, what DEQ is doing. Um, and consistently, DEQ downplays it, right? If they detect an odor, they'll call it a light odor. Um, they say that they dispatched their investigators immediately, but in reality, it took them an average of four hours to show up. And when they showed up, they said, yeah, we smell an odor, but it's a light odor. What they're ignoring is that these emissions are coming from loading events, right? Like they're not continuous. They're these discrete events that happen often in the middle of the night. So ultimately, um, many of y'all might be surprised to know that DEQ put an air monitor in our parish, um, in our neighborhood. They operated it for a year from uh, mid-2021 to mid-2022, and they documented exceedances of legal limits for two different types of pollutants fine particulate matter, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, and, and these are pollutants that have very well-established health effects, right? Asthma, respiratory disease, various types of cancer. And why this is really important is because DEQ is ignoring its own data. And what they did is they said, okay, we don't think the data is reliable. We're going to take this monitor down and move it to the ninth ward, and we're going to operate it there for a year. 
I don't know whether that's started yet. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that no one in this room has been contacted about that project or the status of it. But I can guarantee you what's going to happen is that monitor is going to run in the ninth ward for a year, and then DEQ is going to take it down, and whatever the data say, they're going to say it's not reliable, we're moving on. So our goal today is to inform you all of this issue and to try to start developing a plan for action around this. Because I really do want to emphasize a big part of this is holding DEQ accountable and making sure that air quality in every part of this city is safe for people to breathe. And that's a goal that's going to benefit people in every district, uptown, downtown, New Orleans East, um, every neighborhood. So I, I want to thank you all. We have so much more information we can share. We're happy to answer any questions. Um, and we also have some specific ideas about steps that we could take to work with y'all to, to move the needle on this. Uh, Council Member Murrell. Thank you. Uh, obviously, many of us were on the council in 2021. Um, your stories are heartbreaking. I remember when I was in the legislature, I chaired uh, the Louisiana Senate Environmental Quality Committee. And at that time, and that was God, that was probably in 20. 14, we went to Lake Premier, uh to meet with the residents there who were affected by AGL and their, their uh, gas storage facilities and salt mines. And it's very troubling to me. Have y'all engaged our legislative delegation at all on this issue? We have been working uh, quite closely with Mandy Landry uh, since the beginning. She initially got us meetings with the LDEQ. Uh, we've gone up to the Capitol and worked with her um, specifically on this, uh, we, through her help, were able to realize that this battle in large part is dealing with a very, very adversarial LDEQ. I think that is an understatement. I will tell you that from my perspective, having been a House member and a Senator, your Senator, I believe would be Royce Duplessis, I'm guessing. I've been trying to uh, get in contact it's, with him for months. It's, it would be really important for you to reach out to Royce Duplessis, Jimmy Harris, and the senators in particular. I will tell you, having been a House member and been a senator, um, the departments are infinitely more responsible to senators than House members. That's no, that's no, that's actually not to cast any kind of disbursement on House members. But the challenge you have with departments is that you've got 105 House members and 39 senators, you've got anywhere from 15 to 23 people on a House committee. Most Senate committees have seven. So in my experience, when I was a House member and I would call departments about an issue, they would say, well, we'll get back to you. We'll go meet with somebody. We'll do whatever. When I was a senator and I called the department, they stopped what they were doing and sped to wherever I was at just because the amount of trouble a senator can cause for a department is infinitely higher than a rep. I think it's important to pull together. I know that there is a new um, house district that also encompasses part of the affected area that doesn't have, even have a representative yet, but it would be really important to pull together a coalition of both the house members and the senators of the affected area and have them both kind of, or the group kind of come together with an action plan together, because I think that if you had a few more people in that in that coalition, politically, you would have a lot more leverage to get DEQ to do things. I know that just in Jefferson Parish, when they were having the the odors from the trash being burned, you saw in uh, West Wego. The only reason why you saw movement there was because the senator was John Alario and the House members there were also House members who had influence. It's unfortunate, and I'm happy to be a resource on helping you navigate the state portion because I have some experience there. But putting together that coalition of senators and House members as a group to say this is an issue we're not going to budge on, that is what's going to have movement. Because I'll tell you, in Lake Preneur, um, I had that meeting when I was a senator in that area, and they had had no movement. And Fred Mills, who's the senator from that area, once he got his teeth involved in it, you saw tremendous movement because they they realized that once House and Senate members came together to give them problems on both sides of, of the building, 
they had to respond to it. So I think that they know because DEQ is not stupid that our authority as a council is really to lift y'all up. But as far as the person that controls their budget and what they do, and I'll tell you, I mean, it's a whole, a whole separate meeting, but even the budget instructor for budgeting structure for LDEQ is completely ridiculous. Because for those of you who don't know in TV land, in order for testing to be done, they have to get money from the company they're testing to do it. And that's by design, the way their whole department's designed. So obviously that company has say in which lab they pick, how responsive the lab is, do the results ultimately get released? And this is structurally the problems with Louisiana Department of Environmental, Environmental Quality. So unless we can get together with our local partners and our state partners to really have maximum leverage, and I think you'll find, and I guess I'm happy to work with you offline, if we can get that leverage to the state level coordinated, they will be tremendously more responsive than they're being. But as long as they're kind of able to isolate y'all into little packs where you get help here and help there, that's kind of how they manipulate all local governments and their ability to make LDEQ do what they need to do. That is uh, excellent advice. And uh, we've been pursuing that uh, for uh, quite some time, trying to get everyone on board. I've been sending Royce an email once a month since uh, he entered office and we'll continue to try to get on his radar. Um, one thing we have learned, though, is that New Orleans, in this whole game that we've been engaged in this battle for three years, packs a punch. Uh, when in 2021, we had the whole council come together for the resolution for clean air, the resolution that had this you know, unanimous support that specifically called on the governor and the EPA to intervene and, uh, and compel the DEQ to take action. And they did. Everybody jumped too. We had, you know, all hands on deck and we were all over the news and it was extremely powerful. Since then, every time we do something with our, our council member, something happens. And uh, this is an avenue as far as everything we're looking at, working with y'all is an avenue I think is incredibly important because New Orleans, New Orleans cannot, you know, uh, depend on uh, the LDEQ to do its job. The, they can't depend on the on Jefferson Parish across the river to even enforce its own, you know, uh, nuisance ordinances. Uh, New Orleans in some capacity needs to uh, speak up for itself, defend itself. And uh, uh, like you said, you know, holding us up, you know, we're not asking you, know, you to, you know, exercise some sort of, you know, uh, you know, uh, law, you know, uh, you know, for the, against the DEQ or anything like that. But even just getting, you know, the voice of uh, the council. Uh, and there's a number of other things, you know, oh, that we can do. Um, uh, legal action. The city of New Orleans is quite capable of taking legal action, whether it be the LDEQ, Jefferson Parish, BWC itself, the people who are, you know, killing us. Um, that would be, uh, you know, uh, an avenue of action. The formation of an air monitoring program of its own. Uh, trying to get the LDEQ to even respect its own results when they install an air monitoring program in our neighborhood, which finds exceedances. You know, we have, you know, uh, a, a letter uh, from uh, Council Member Harris that has yet been unanswered by uh, the Secretary Chuck Carr Brown. So um, the, the main thing, though, that we think is, you know, uh, the most promising, you know, avenue of action would be another resolution. Uh, particularly if we were to have a resolution, I mean, we could include anything in it really, you know, uh, but a resolution just demanding that the DEQ or the EPA address this air monitoring uh, exceedances that they found in our neighborhood. They install an air monitor basically to allay our concerns, you know, in the, in the words of, you know, the, uh, the deputy secretary, we're going to install a monitor and it will allay your concerns. Uh, they install it. And then when it finds something bad, they act like it, it, oh, oh, that, oh, that monitor, Oh, that's not reliable, but we're going to use it in the ninth ward now. So asking those questions and holding them accountable. And I think, I mean, like I said, certainly I'm not trying to discourage you from what options are available in the city. But what I will tell you is that, for example, the challenge we always have dealing with Jefferson Parish as our neighbors is that Jefferson Parish is a very different parish than we are as far as how they structure their development. As a city, because we're landlocked, we really do not have 
heavily industrialized areas. And if we do, they're kind of centralized away from major population centers for the most part. Jefferson Parish, because it's so much more spread out, I would say with early industrialization, like across the river, they have developed in a way that is not necessarily helpful to us when we have residential areas that are in direct, in the direct area of effect or harm. They didn't take into consideration that the river is not really that much of a barrier. And it's a constant problem we have. To your point, I do think it would be worth as a council trying to interact with our Jefferson Parish Council colleagues to talk about pressuring the company, for example, to pay for standard non-moving air monitors that we could actualize and use to track emissions. Because uh, as I said before, if you're trying, if we can't, it's foolish to think that LDEQ, who has a monitor that is likely half subsidized by the company that's putting it up, Part of, those, part of that kind of Faustian bargain, the way we've structured LEDQ in the state of Louisiana is that part of the benefit those companies get for paying for the monitoring is that they're the first ones to go, that monitor we paid you to pay for, the numbers aren't good, so yeah, it must be malfunctioning. Like this isn't something that came out of the air. I think if we could get our colleagues across the river to work with us put pressure on the plant to have standard monitors up that we as both Jefferson and Orleans Parish could have access to, to see the data in real time, that would be a way, for example, to get reliable data that can't be manipulated. I do, I don't disagree. I think that having a resolution would be fantastic and I would fully support one, but I really would encourage you, like I said, I'm happy to sit down and help y'all work through the politics of it. Unless you bring true power to bear on DEQ in Baton Rouge where they exist. They, for every two steps forward, they go three steps back. And unless you've got someone behind them pushing them to continue going forward, it just becomes a very frustrating dance. Cause I've been there. I used to chair a committee that regulated them. And it really is like, you think you've got them going in the right direction. And then you take your eyes off them for 15 minutes and they're, worse than they were when you started. So I'll, I'll happy visit with you offline, figure out how we can work that out. I support all of Councilman Harris's efforts to try and use leverage that whatever the city has to, to, to bring to bear. But I do want to try and find something definitive that would give y'all A, access to constant real-time information and B, a coalition that could really kind of have a definitive resolution because I think you're entitled to one after three years. I mean, it seems like this is an issue where it's a constant threat that affects your quality of life every single day. And to be candid, if you look at the city of New Orleans, the cost of living, where you can live, where you can't live, for all practical purposes, many people are trapped where they live. There's You love your neighbors, but also by virtue of the city being so expensive and everything else, you can't go anywhere else. So we got to make it work for y'all. Absolutely. And and thank you, um, Council Member Morell. Um, I love the idea of trying to make progress with the Jefferson Parish Council. If if you or anyone in this room can do that successfully, I will vote for you in whatever position you run for in all eternity. Because we have been trying so I'll, hard. I will, I will take you up on that. Okay. I will take you up on that. <laughs> Um, and I, I do want to just make one quick point, um, and that is air monitoring is good, but it's still in the stage of characterizing the problem, right? So kind of regardless of what the air monitors say, we know there's a massive hot asphalt facility within a mile of people's homes and people are like choking on hot asphalt fumes, right? So I guess I would sort of suggest if we can engage with Jefferson Parish, but have it more focused not on characterizing the problem, but finding a solution to the problem. Yeah. Thank you. Any council member Green? Well, what is a possible solution? Pollution controls. So right now, and, and this is why I think it's important to like engage with community members, because right now what they're doing is they have these big bulk storage tanks and asphalt you have to heat to like 400 degrees in order for it to be liquid to move it. 
So they're hot, they're off gassing, and they're basically spraying it into barges without anything to capture those fumes. What they've started doing is they've started putting filters on the tanks and saying, oh, we have pollution controls now, right? But that's not where the fume, where most of the fumes are coming from, right? Like most of the fumes are coming when you spray that hot, os hot asphalt into the barge on the river. So they're talking, they're making a big deal and talking a whole lot about all this money they're spending to control a very small fraction of the emissions. The ultimate problem really is that no one should have ever thought it was a good idea to, to build bulk asphalt storage tanks so close to people's homes, right? There's lots of other products that they could have handled and stored. Um, but there are, there are options for pollution controls on the barge loading end of things. And that's, I think, what we really wanna push for. And if the company says that's too expensive and it's not feasible, switch your product. The, the situation thus far has been, you know, or, or since, you know, uh, since the initial, you know, victories that we had with the resolution for clean air and, you know, moving forward, you know, fighting this battle, we're now in a holding pattern where essentially they load a barge with hot asphalt. And if there is a south wind or southeast wind, which there almost always is, uh, we get inundated with it. We then file complaints. The investigators for the LDEQ uh, follow up on those complaints and they go conduct what they call surveillance. And they will do this uh, three days to a week afterwards. Their surveillance is driving around sniffing with their nose. Whether they smell anything or not does not change the outcome of the investigation. But they look at the timing of the, the complaints. They look at the, uh, the wind data at the time and they conclude that, okay, it must be BWC or its neighbor IMTT. They then request the activity logs of these two facilities, and they find that BWC is indeed loading or unloading a barge of hot asphalt. However, the investigation then ends with the investigator writing no further action necessary when they email BWC and they ask them, are you doing anything wrong? And they respond, no upset conditions. And that's the end of the investigation. And this is ad nauseum. I have scores of these investigations. Uh, these, these poor investigators that work for LDEQ are as frustrated as I am. And they're basically like, they are permitted to do this. So the LDEQ, you know, permitting you know, this facility to do this right here, uh, acknowledging that there is a problem is what we did in the first place with New Orleans and uh, with the New Orleans City Council, and that got everybody to jump too. So having everybody in our corner, I agree with you that we need to get this coalition, you know, at the state, and we're working on that. And to be clear, during this meeting, Senator Duplessis has reached out to my office. He's fully engaged. He wants to meet with y'all. And on top of that, he has also been recently appointed to the Environmental Quality Committee yes. on the State Senate. So Fantastic. I think that he'll be a tremendous asset in getting this resolved in a very definitive way because the House doesn't even have an Environmental Quality Committee. The state is so not committed to environmental quality that in the House they merged it into natural resources. So the committee that oversees the expansion of oil and gas platforms also regulates them and their environmental, at least at the Senate, it's still a standalone committee. Senator Duplessis is on it. He's reached out to us. He wants to visit with y'all. And I think that would be a tremendous way Fantastic. if we can get stuff going at the local level and the state level to really pincer them in a position where we get some real definitive movement. Absolutely. Well, uh, this is exactly the type of conversation that we wanted to be having and getting on the radar of a broader amount of the current you know, city council members is exactly what we wanted. We'd be extremely happy to leave here knowing that we have plans with y'all to continue to move forward addressing this problem. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank you. all And I just want to quickly say is some I work in a field where people call me with problems and challenges and I know how overwhelming it is. And let me promise you that whatever effort y'all invest in us will maximize that tenfold. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Okay, and that brings us to our final item, which is item number six. I think Greg Nichols is presenting on that one and that's uh, building performance standards. Yep, that's our last name. 
Good morning. Hey, good morning and good morning to you also, <laughs> Zach. Last, but I hope not least. Nope, not at all. Whenever you're ready, you can proceed. Thank you. Um, so good morning, Greg Nichols. I'm the Deputy Chief Resilience Officer. I lead the Office of Resilience and Sustainability. Uh, with me, I have Zachary Moreau, uh, who manages external affairs for our office uh, and including our relationships with the White House and the Institute for Market Transformation, uh, who we've partnered with on the Building Performance Standards Coalition. Um, so I'll have a brief presentation. I'll start with some previous energy efficiency efforts uh, at the city. Uh, we'll define what, the, what uh, a building performance standard uh, is and how they're developed. Uh, and then we'll finish with what resources are available and a potential timeline. <clears throat> so um, first, why energy efficiency? Um, our office uh, recently completed the city's latest uh, greenhouse gas inventory for 2021, where we found that approximately 47% of the city's emissions are energy related, and almost half of that amount, 43%, come from large commercial buildings. The council has taken crucial, crucial steps in your role as Entergy New Orleans regulator to clean our grid through the renewable clean portfolio standard you passed. In addition, we also need to reduce uh, energy use so there's more time to build the clean energy uh, sources we need to meet and even exceed those goals uh, and to meet the energy demand needs from the electrification of transportation. Uh, in 2018, former staff in our office in partnership with the DDD led the NOLA Energy Challenge, which comprised 40 uh, large downtown buildings who participated in a voluntary competition to disclose and reduce energy use, with five different awards ranging from great, uh, the greatest energy reduction to best energy star score. The council has also led uh, several ener energy efficiency efforts as well. In 2018 and 19, a, benchmarking, a draft benchmark, benchmarking ordinance which would require energy use disclosure by large uh, building was drafted by former staff in our office. The city's law department at that time raised some concerns around the structure of that ordinance, but our office believes that there are solutions to those concerns that will allow us to move forward. In addition, the council in 2019 passed a resolution allowing building owners uh, to request whole building energy data from Ener Entergy, a key step needed to report large building energy use. And just this past year, of course, you passed the lead ordinance to require the city facilities to be constructed to lead gold standards moving forward. And the council, of course, regularly approves the three-year plans for the Energy Smart Program that provides incentives for energy efficiency upgrades for residents and businesses throughout the city. The city has made significant pro progress reducing energy use in our own buildings as well. Starting in 2018, uh, the property management department uh, implemented 38 energy efficiency projects, which have reduced energy use at city buildings by 23%. Here, you can see the impact of one of those projects at Juvenile Court, uh, where energy use has been uh, reduced by approximately 100% since mid-2021, primarily due to a retro commissioning project where we upgraded HVAC controls to set building schedules and turn off spaces overnight, as well as ensure all devices are operating properly. So we've made progress, but we know we have a lot more work to do. That's why last week our office announced that we have joined the White House's Building Performance Standards or BPS coalition, joining over 40 jurisdictions around the country working to implement this innovative climate policy. I'd like to take a moment to thank the White House Council on Environmental Quality and the Institute for Market Transfer Transformation or IMT for accepting our request to join the coalition. We're very excited to learn best practices from them as well as other cities around the country. So what exactly are building performance standards or BPS as we refer to it? They are state and local laws that require existing large buildings, usually above a certain square footage threshold to achieve minimum levels of energy or climate performance over time. This is a fundamental change to how we approach buildings. In addition to reviewing how a building is designed and constructed, BPS demands we look at how a building operates after certificates of occupancy are issued. I'll speak to what that process and potential legislation uh, here in New Orleans could look like shortly, but I do wanna highlight this map uh, to show the council and the public what the city is gaining by joining this coalition. As I just mentioned, we are now one of over 40 city states 
uh, and counties which are either actively working on BPS legislation or currently implementing a BPS law that has already been passed. As you can see, we're now one of four southeastern cities, uh, including Atlanta, Orlando, and Savannah, to have joined the coalition. So we'll have both a regional network of cities with similar energy use patterns, as well as a national network of climate champions to learn from as well. <clears throat> so what does this process look like? First, and perhaps most importantly, is a robust community stakeholder engagement proce process to engage residents, build building owners, businesses, our utility, and of course, council members uh, and your staff who will help us craft this legislation. From there, we'll embark on a significant planning process to research best practices and continue coordinating with stakeholders. Next, we'll incorporate uh, feedback from stakeholders into draft policies and then work with this council to introduce and debate legislation. We, of course, hope for a successful piece of legislation that would then require ongoing implementation by the administration. I'd like to note two things about this process. One, this process laid out here requires us to craft a piece of legislation that meets the needs of New Orleans. While BPS laws do have similar features, this robust stakeholder engagement uh, is a design feature meant to build consensus uh, among local stakeholders. Two, implementing this policy will be a large un undertaking to implement. And I don't wanna undersell that. This is a new policy that will require new enforcement mechanisms and it will be a big shift here at City Hall. Well, safety and permits is the department that currently might make the most sense to house this in, and we've had high level conversations with them about this, this concept. Many other cities have buildings, uh, divisions or departments that enforce policies like this. A shift as big as this is why the time I, I'll lay out later is in years and not months. So what are the compliance details that could be part of a BPS law? Typically, BPS lays out both a final performance standard and an interim performance standard. The final performance standard is the long-term goal that, a build, that a buildings must meet, typically 15 or 30 years into the future, and they are the same for each type of building. Interim performance standards are individualized. Each building has its own trajectory for reaching that final performance standard based on its performance in the baseline year. Here's an example of what that might look, for, look like for three large office buildings. You can see the baseline year energy usage for these three buildings is quite different, but they're all heading to the same final performance standard in the future. Each of these three buildings might have a different a path to achieve that end goal. Building C, uh, who is currently a high performing building, might be focused on uh, upgrading the lighting in their building. However, building A with high energy use uh, might need to plan and budget for larger retrofits to their HVAC, HVAC systems, which tend to drive energy use. Either way, if a building needs additional flexibility, BPS legislation can and should uh, allow for it through a building performance action plans, which allow building owners to create customized plans for their buildings to meet the goals laid out in the legislation. So what does New Orleans stand to gain from adopting a BPS law? There are many benefits. Building performance standards can help us meet our climate goals through decarbonization and electrify, electrifying our buildings. By lowering energy use, they help provide more grid reliability by lowering peak demand for energy during extreme weather events. For renters in large buildings, they help lower energy bills and ease the energy burden we know many in New Orleans struggle with. Uh, and it also helps lower operating costs for large building owners and improve their bottom line. The legislation can also improve the indoor air quality of buildings uh, and their health of, their, uh, of, of its occupants through upgraded HVAC systems and the elimination of fossil fuel use in buildings. Finally, BPS legislation is also designed to be inclusive and equitable, which I'll expand uh, on a little bit more in the next slide. One recommendation that the BPS coalition has suggested is the creation of a community accountability board as a part of BP BPS legislation. This board would be composed of local community groups and expert in, experts in racial and social equity, and would be tasked with reviewing the impact of the ordinance on disinfested communities and recommend actions to increase equity. Some of those actions could be allocating funds for earmarked, uh, all allocating funds be earmarked for disinvested communities, producing reports which evaluate the equity impacts, advising on the selection of a building improvement board that would help administer the legislation and advise on rules and complementary programs. Some of, uh, some of you or members of the public may be wondering about the financing, need to, financing needed to make these upgrades and retrofits possible. Thankfully, the Inflation Reduction Act passed last year contains several rebate or deduction programs, which I've highlighted on this slide, which commercial and multifamily buildings can tap into to assist uh, with financing these upgrades. 
Additionally, the payback from energy savings can rapidly cover the cost for upgrades as well. Going back to the energy savings I spoke about at juvenile court earlier, those upgrades cost the city around $100,000, but the energy savings were approximately 10K per month, and the city used an energy smart incentive of 70,000 to help defray initial costs. So with the incentive, the city recouped our investment within three months, and even without the incentive, we would have paid ourselves back in less than a year. One final thing I do want to note about BPS is how they work in connection with the, with the energy codes. Uh, in June of 2022, the state of Louisiana passed updated energy codes for the entire state, moving from 2009 standards to 2021, which should position our new buildings to operate much more efficiently. However, those energy codes will only apply to new construction or major renovation, and the enforcement around them will stop once a building obtains its certificate of occupancy. That's why BPS laws are important, uh, an important part of the remaining puzzle. They enforce building energy performance after a building is occupied. New energy codes set new buildings up to meet BPS standards, but even new modern buildings can operate inefficiently ac after occupancy. So BPS ensures that they continue to meet their efficient design standards into the future. So what resources are we tapping into as a part of this initiative? Uh, as a part of the coalition, we'll receive technical support from federal agencies and national uh, energy efficiency nonprofits like IMT and knowledge sharing from jurisdictions adopting these standards across the country. We've also signed on to two Department of Energy grants, one with the Institute for Market Transformation on inclusive community engagement partnerships around BPS implement implementation, as well as the, as the state of Louisiana and the Southeast Energy Efficiency Alliance on support and training for city staff around implementing our new energy codes. In terms of our office's capacity, we are actively recruiting and hiring for an energy policy position within our office that would lead this and the other, uh, this and, and the other energy policy efforts outlined in our climate action plan. Given the scope and size of this BPS effort, we have worked with FUSE to develop a one-year fellowship to lead the engagement and policy development work around BPS. We are still actively seeking the match funding FUSE requires the city to provide, so finalizing that hire is on hold until we secure that funding. In terms of a timeline, we anticipate that this process will take around 18 to 24 months. Many of the other jurisdictions who joined the BPS coalition joined in January 2022 with a commitment of adoption by Earth Day 2024, so April 22nd. So while that timeline may seem lengthy, it is a bit more aggressive since we joined the coalition a little later. However, we won't likely start this process until we get these two positions filled that I just mentioned. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Greg, what's the cost of the uh, the salaries for the FUSE fellows? Uh, $80,000 is the match they're asking the city to provide. Got it. And that'll provide two people? Uh, that's one. Uh, okay. We also have a FUSE fellow working on the EV that Dan spoke about earlier. Oh, got uh, it. Got it. But you need you need one. We just need the match funding for the, the BPS. The 80000 Got it. Okay. Let me work on, on helping we, helping you with that. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to the Thank CAO you. about that. Um, look, I just want to say that we've been talking about BPS for quite some time. And, and really, Greg, it's under your leadership that you've found a way to get to yes. And so I, I really um, appreciate that. I know that um, there's been, you know, proposed legislation coming from the community in, in the past, and there was, a, there was resistance coming from the administration, but you you got us to a yes, and I appreciate that. And and, and I'll say this, I mean, I appreciate how the administration, um, you know, has ended up supporting things that the council was moving quickly on that they said, well, let's hold off, you know, lead was one of them, another had to do with, uh, you know, transitioning our fleet to electrification and, and you know, the while there was resistance initially and, and potential op opposition to those, now they're to the yes, you know, actually it was the good idea. So um, I know, Greg, that, that you've been a big part of that, and we really appreciate your partnership uh, with the council. Any questions from the dais? Seeing none, let me take public comment real quick. Uh, let's see, we've got Nathan Lott followed by Tillman Hardy. Yes, good morning, council members. Good Nathan morning. Lott here on behalf of Preservation Resource Center of New Orleans. Just begin by saying I didn't fill out a card for Lincoln Beach, but we're very excited about that project and fully supportive. We did a series of articles in our magazine preservation in print a few years ago and um, very excited That's to see right. that come to fruition. I did wanna say something about uh, the building performance standard, um, just to make it known that we're deeply committed to building performance improvements in the historic building stock in our city. Uh, we're also very aware that there need to be some special considerations, depending on the type of building, the age of the building, whether or not it's in a historic district, whether or not they're trying to use or have used historic tax credits. So we appreciate the stakeholder engagement and the uh, community board. I would love to have 
a seat at the table or help you find the right people to have a seat at the table so that we don't create this false uh, perception of conflict between uh, historic districts um, or historic designation and building performance improvements. I think taking a look at the actual carbon intensity of a building after construction instead of being prescriptive on the front end may actually be a, a better way to do that. Yeah. Um, I've been very lucky to get involved with a zero net carbon collaboration for existing and historic buildings, which is a national umbrella uh, collaboration involving uh, the Association of Preservation Technology, the American Institute of Architects and the Carbon Leadership Forum, and bunches of engineers and architects who are way smarter than me uh, with some amazing case studies. Unfortunately, many of them uh, in New York or California, we have a hot, humid climate here. There's some different considerations around moisture. Um, but yeah, I think we have an opportunity to pioneer some things. And we've got real brain trust here um, that I don't want to dis uh, dismiss. Uh, EDR just took the lead on writing the Building Reuse is Climate Action Guide for the American Institute of Architects. I was lucky to play a very small role on an advisory committee to that. So they might be willing and able to help do a presentation here at some point uh, to the committee in the future. And hopefully we can get to the point where we're actually offering more to individual homeowners and uh, owners of small multifamily properties, as my colleague from the Alliance alluded to, um, to make an impact there as well. Thank you. Thanks. Tillman Hardy, and then we'll take online comment. I'm glad to hear that these uh, building performance standards are being implemented. It's been a long time. Um, I uh, attended Tulane School of Architecture before Hurricane Katrina. And um, when I started working for Ray Nagin um, as the code import or the New Orleans Redevelopment Authority blighted properties person, and I started asking questions about sustainability prior to Katrina, and everybody said, what the hell are you talking about? And we don't have time for this shit, you know. And then after Katrina, when the planners came in town, I said the same thing about sustainability and nobody wanted to talk about it. Now, uh, Core USA was the first company in the state of Louisiana to certify, train and certify contractors in building performance, um, BPI, uh, accredited Core USA as the first company in the state of Louisiana. And this is why Karen Carter Peterson and her friends got rid of Core USA or tried to. We're still here. I'm still here. So I look forward to working with um, this office. I worked with Charles Allen um, years when he was still in office. And Charles Allen actually worked with Core USA. Uh, as the CEO of Core USA uh, for some time prior to I ran for office. And so after I ran for office, a lot of political corrupt people like Oliver Thomas uh, have worked really hard to make that we can maintain this culture of corruption. And I'm asking this council to stop pretending like Oliver Thomas is not playing games. And what he's done to me personally. That's your time, sir. Let's talk about Melanie. That's your time, sir. Let's talk about Lakidra. Let's talk about Charmel. Mr. Hardy, that's your time. Let's stop playing games. All right, public comment online, please. Yes, ma'am, there are two public comments. Um, one is from Deborah Lombard. She says, as I drive around New Orleans, I continue to see parking lots and exterior buildings all over, exterior lights and fans on during the day. We are talking about the lowest hanging fruit. Turn exterior lights off when it's daytime. Entities with exterior lights on during the day should be implored to have them fixed immediately if the photo cells are bad, including the city street lights. Remember, building performance standards can apply to all meters, including meters or at grade parking lots with no building, not just electric meters associated with the building itself. And the second comment is from Dana Solney. She, she says, building standards are very important. They are, there are currently historic buildings being worked on without permits. Those are the public comments. Okay, and that concludes your presentation and that completes our meeting. Thank you. Um, I'll, Appreciate uh, that, a motion to adjourn by Councilman Morrell. I'll second, all in favor, aye, it's unanimous. Thank you.